Okay, Vivi, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It's going to be a good conversation. I look forward to it. So if you could just introduce yourself to the audience, you know, your name, where you're from, where you're currently playing, and then we'll just go a little bit through your, your journey. Yeah, so I'm Vivi, Vivi Bayer, you say in German. Um, I am now 26 years old. And I have played in different places in, in the world. I grew up in Germany. I'm German. Um, went to school there, played with with boys until I was 16, 17. And then I kind of jumped right into the women's game um, and played Bundesliga very young. And then I decided to go to the U.S. for four and a half years in the end. Um, played U.S. college soccer. And then I jumped to Italy uh, to play professional soccer here. So I played last year in Naples, Napoli, mm. and now I'm in Como. That's kind of like... Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. So how, how does the, how does the system work, you know, for, for women in, in Germany, you know, deep through the youth system and like, when did you start yeah. playing? I started playing like always. I, I don't know. I was like four years old when I, when I wow. joined um with the boys i don't know i played in kindergarten and the guys were just like hey like just come to practice with us so i was like okay um and i mean now it's for sure different than it was back then like now there are a lot of women's like girls teams um back then there was not as much so i i played with the guys um until i was like 15 16 which for me soccer wise was the best that could have happened for sure um and that was a great experience and i'm I'm actually very happy that it was like that and that i um was able to play with guys instead of absolutely. girls <laughs> absolutely why do you think that helped you just like in terms of speed of play things like that yeah absolutely like speed of play um also like technical abilities even though now the the women's soccer is developing a lot but for sure that and also just toughness um physically and also mentally um, mm-hmm. it's different mm-hmm. being with the guys a different tone in the locker room a different tone on the field but it's, yeah, it's a good thing absolutely so did, did you sign a professional contract in germany um or did you like play in an academy basically and then go over to to play in college uh no i i played professionally in germany but back then i was first of all very very young so my payment was very low and mm-hmm. um also like back then the soccer wasn't as good as development wasn't as good so the payments weren't as high yet so i signed the contract but it wasn't a professional contract let's say like that okay okay so where did you play uh most of your you know in, your uh women's football uh in jena <laughs> where i'm from okay yeah, yeah i know you uh, i actually have uh one of my buddies um we went to high school together he actually plays now for for the men's team over there really who is it, it lucas Stoffer. Yeah, I, I know his name. Like, I've heard yeah. him. But, um, okay. yeah. Yeah, Small that's my hometown. World. Yeah. Wow, wow. <laughs> so, I went to the sports school there, and I played for the guys, FC Kaltes um in the youth wow. academy, and um, uh-huh. went to the women. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, if you could, you know, I think the system in Germany is incredible. I mean, um, like, you you describe sports school. I mean, I think, obviously, the U.S. Had, U.S. is now developing, but how did that work? Like, if you could describe for the listeners how, you know, how often you guys trained and how focused it was and, and the focus on, you know, technical development and things like that. Yeah, no, it was amazing for sure. Um, so it's a sports school, meaning that we had different um, sports. Uh, soccer was one of them, female and male. Mm-hmm. Um, and what it allowed us to do was to also train in the morning where other people just have school. So we sure. had soccer within school and usually in the in these morning sessions we would uh, focus a lot on technical ability um okay. just like shooting drills crossing drills like actually always a lot of fun um <laughs> just like working on your technical ability and um also later on when you play i don't know national team or for the regional teams and you miss a lot of school the school really supported you to be able to to go and do that um but mm-hmm. still keep up keep up on your schoolwork at the same sure. time so it was it was amazing yeah no it's interesting the wording you used fit um fit school into soccer instead of fit uh yeah. soccer into school i think that's that's a major difference you know when you have that focus so, so did you feel that really helped you develop your you know your technical ability yeah for sure i mean 
I am a big fan of repetition. Like the more you do something, mm-hmm. the better you will you will get. And Absolutely. I remember one one year we had a teacher who said every day, every morning you have to complete at least one hundred passes. So we were just like wow. pass wow. the ball, pass the ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean those those little things uh, they they may seem redundant, but I think they're very important for your development. And I I mean I always enjoyed doing it. So for me it was yeah. always fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's a uh, book, I don't know if you read it, Habits by James Clear. And he, mm-hmm. he talks about, you know, um, like when you can, can really um, focus on the boring things and you can, um, you know, the boring things like passing, the fundamentals, the basics, and you could find enjoyment in that. That's when you can really master you know, the sport or the technique. And I, 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 you know, always talk about that myself, especially with younger guys and girls, like, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you, you know, you want to do the cool tricks, the sexy tricks you see on Instagram (laughs) and the juggling tricks. But the most important thing is, is the one, two touch passing, the simple, you know, long balls, the short balls, you know, simple dribbles. Um, And, and when you can find enjoyment in those, you know, consistent uh, repetitions, I think that's when you can really improve. Absolutely. I totally agree. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So did you always have the, you know, the dream and desire to go play in the U.S. or how did that come about? Sorry, can you repeat? (laughs) Yeah. Did you always have like the dream and desire to play in the U.S. or, you know, how did that come about? Uh, In the U.S. actually, no. Um, It wasn't really on my radar until I was about to finish school and um, some college coaches got in touch with me and I didn't even really think about the opportunity to go to the U.S. and play and study. Um, But once I I looked into it, I just thought it was a very, very cool experience because I for sure wanted a change since I've always been in my hometown. Um, Mm -hmm. So I was looking for something new anyways. And for me, school and education has always been important because obviously also on the female side, it's not as um, yeah normal to live from soccer. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was important for me to get my education also. So it was perfect once I got the opportunity to go to the U.S. and play and study. For sure, so. for sure. So where, where did these coaches see you play? How did they identify you? I think I I was fortunate because I always played in the youth national teams of Germany. Yeah. And I think when you do that, you just kind of get on the radar of for sure. many different coaches. So mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. helped for sure. So, so what, te- what, what schools were like most interested in you besides UConn? Um, FSU, actually. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And some other smaller schools. Um, but the FSU was probably the, the biggest name, which it's mm-hmm. really hard um, as a German who doesn't know the U.S. soccer system or the college system to actually know what schools are good and which are not. So that's why I actually went to University of Maine my first two years, oh, wow, which is okay. also Division One, but nice. um, a different conference. And I soccer wise wasn't satisfied there. So that's why I mm. um, transferred to UConn after two years. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. So like what you said that, um, you know, as a German, it's, it's hard to identify proper schools in the U S did you like work through? Cause I know now they have like agencies that help you. Did, did, um, you work with an agency or did just, you work just between you and the, uh, the, the school, the coach? Yeah. So like we were saying, uh, did you use an agency or, you know, was it just you between you and the school or you, um, you and the coach? Um, no, like back then I didn't use an agency. Um, so it was just my mom helped me a lot, to be honest, and okay. Um, okay. The, the coaches. Yeah. So it was it was like looking back, I think it would have been helpful to have been with an agency just with all of the course. processes and the papers. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it was what it was and it's, of it all turned out okay. Mm-hmm. And how, how was the, besides being really cold up in Maine, how was like the environment, like the the football environment, the school? Um, well, I, I really liked the school and also the athletic part of the school. It just, I don't know if it was due to the conference that we played in, but I just didn't feel completely challenged soccer wise. I hear um, so I, I just looked for something else after my sophomore year um, and mm-hmm. then UConn. 
was interested so i was like yukon is a great school um awesome. with with a good program so mm -hmm. and the facilities are incredible huh? yeah they they yeah. even just updated everything and i'm like kind of sad that i already left because now everything yeah. is even newer for uh, sure it's insane that's the thing about like some college programs in the u.s like the the facilities are better than some professional teams you know for sure for so. sure but so how was the environment overall at UConn? Did you find more of a challenge, you know, football wise? Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. There was a greater death within, within the squad. Um, the, the trainings were harder um, also like on and off the field. Um, I would also say that the school was more challenging, like overall, just a little bit more demanding, but that's what I was looking for. And for sure. Yeah, it was good. So what what did you major in in school? I majored in psychology. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. And how was it overall? Like, because uh, I know you know Germans are you know you guys are very um, you know in terms of the education system like strict and you are very very yeah. good and orderly with that. How and I, I I've heard many times before like the the schooling in Germany is much tougher than the U.S. Did you? I mean, obviously you were going to college, but did you find like it a bit more, you know, easy, more lax than, than schooling in Germany? Yeah, I, I would yeah. say so. Like in the beginning, of course, for me, the, the biggest challenge was the English. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. my English has always been good, but it's different going mm -hmm. to school. Like absolutely, absolutely. Um, in English. Um, but I mean, luckily, you learn pretty quickly and you improve very quickly. Um, but yeah, a lot of the things, especially the first two years, I have already had in school. So mm -hmm. it was, it was. I mean, not not saying that it's easy to study in the U.S., but yeah, um, for sure, I I was used to the to the demands and the load of schoolwork. For sure, I mean, it's it's not easy, you know, to say the least, to study in a, in a in a different language than your mother language. So it's I'm yeah. sure like being. I think the biggest thing with languages, you could probably agree, is like, you know, just being put into that environment and having to adapt to it, you know, and having that pressure improve you over time. Yeah, for sure. I, I can say the same with my Italian now. I mean, I've been in Italy for, for two years now. And of course, it's very hard in the beginning because I didn't have Italian in school. So it was kind exactly. of from zero. Wow. Um, but but now, I mean, it's not perfect, but I can communicate and I understand everything. So. Really? That's awesome. That's awesome. So did, did you, to learn Italian, did you start going to a school or did you, you know, kind of pick it up uh, with your teammates and everything? Uh, I actually started kind of with Duolingo in the beginning, wow, just wow, to get like wow. the basics done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, in the beginning, I just tried to pick things up, but then I decided to actually study and I took lessons privately because I wanted wow. to improve faster. And mm -hmm. Once you hit like this, the certain level where you pick up most words, then I think just being around Italian speaking people helps you to. Oh, for sure. You know, yeah. Just, just being immersed in it. How are, how are um, the people in Italy? How are the, how is their English overall? I, I thought better, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since we're in Europe, I thought, I don't know, it's normal to have English in school, but. For sure. <laughs> Yeah. Like there, most of them don't speak that well, to be honest. Uh -huh. Interesting, interesting. Ah, well, at least their food's really good, I'm sure. That's that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the that's food culture here is good. Oh yeah, I'm sure. So, what's your favorite dish uh, in Italy? In Italy, that's a tough question, but um, I for sure love risotto, like any uh -huh. kind of risotto, like with veggies or mm. um, cheese. <laughs> Sounds excellent. Yeah. I'm sure their wine is pretty good as well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can't complain. <laughs> For sure. So how did you um, make the move, you know, from from UConn uh, to the professional ranks? How did that process uh, work? Yeah, uh, definitely not easy. Um I also decided to apply for the NWSL draft, but I knew that it was um, tough um because we didn't make any playoffs that year and also as an international player it's also harder to get a contract in the NWSL than it is for Americans so I knew that I 
I had to look also in Europe and also I was not opposed to going back to Europe. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I have an agent who, who helped me and mm-hmm. got some offers for me. And I don't know, Napoli just uh, sounded, sounded right for me in that moment and turned yeah. out to be the right decision. And I'm, I'm happy I went there. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if you, can you like walk us through like a day, a day in your life, you know, uh, as a professional, uh, like how, you know, just to like kind of compare it to like the student athlete. Um, yeah. Like how is it, how is it different? Oh, uh, well, of course the, the school, school work is not there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and there's a little bit less structure in your day. If like, it's because you don't have to go to lectures or whatever, but I usually, um, like let's say a normal day for me is I would get up, uh, have my breakfast, have a kind of chill morning, but then I usually go to the gym mm-hmm. um, to to work on some some things. I usually talk to our athletic or um, strength and conditioning coach. That's how you mm-hmm. say. Um, to obviously not do too much or like to kind of um, yeah organize it with the with what we do in the afternoon in practice and how the sure. week week looks like. And then I I have lunch and I basically get ready for practice. We practice at three. Um, okay. So I'm usually at the field around two because physiotherapy doing some. And then we practice and usually until around five. And then after we take we take our time for physiotherapy recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like that and I go back home I have my dinner and then depending on how I feel some some mornings I do yoga if I'm very tired like stretching mm-hmm. yoga um, mm-hmm. or also in the evenings like rolling out um, depends a little bit on how my body feels and um, what it needs for sure no I think I think that's key what you said I mean I think uh, you know Nowadays, uh, the grind hard mentality is always preached, but I think, you know, the most important thing is to work hard and smart. And I think, you know, I always yeah. try to talk, talk to that, talk about that with younger athletes, like in terms of, you know, finding out the periodization schedule for the week mm-hmm. with your team, like, you know, and I think obviously over time you get used to it, like how the loads are. And then, like you said, you know, listening to your body day to day and then, you know, training, based off of that. And, uh, I think that's, that's huge. And I think being a pro, one of the most important things is being able to listen to your own body, you know? Exactly. For sure. For sure. And I mean, now I'm 26 years old, so I have a few years under my belt. Um, for sure. and, and you learn, you learn from your mistakes, you learn to listen to your body, you learn to, you know, um, recognize the science that the body is giving you and, and what it needs. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so when you go into the gym, what type of things do you do you like to work on? What type of things do you like to do that you know think uh, help improve you out on the pitch? Yeah. Um, well, I I just came back from a pretty bad injury, so right now I'm still kind of let's say I'm I'm, I'm back on the field. I'm all one hundred percent, but I'm still trying to you know strengthen my my knee, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. the area around happened? my knee. Um, I had a bad tackle with somebody in, in practice and I kind of, yeah, like everything kind of. So ACL, MCL, wow. meniscus. Wow. Yeah. So how long were you out? Um, actually not that long, uh, surprisingly. I, wow. I think I made my comeback after seven and a half months. Wow. That's quick. Wow. That's quick. Yeah, it was very quick. I was surprised too, to be honest. <laughs> like I didn't expect it to go that quick. But I think sure. you just, um, if you work disciplined and smart, as you said, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then I think it's possible with the right mm-hmm. people around you and the right mindset. Yeah, and it shows that you that you definitely take care of everything off the pitch as well. I mean, you know, if your hydration is good, nutrition, your your uh, your sleep. And you're doing all the proper rehab. I mean, I think yeah. you could come back sooner than you know expected. For sure, I totally agree. I totally agree. What type of advice could you give to to players? Because you know, obviously, as a footballer, injuries happen. You know, what type mm-hmm. of advice, like from a mental standpoint, 
can you give players that, you know, are struggling with an injury and obviously you miss the pitch, you, you miss being out there with the team and sometimes you're doing your little uh, your boring exercises that you need to do. <laughs> and it's just like, man, I just want to be on the pitch and playing like, cause yeah. you know, I think, I think a big thing, what an injury does is it really strengthens you mental mentally, but like what any tips that you use, anything you had in your mind during your injury? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of things that play into it. I think it's important to keep perspective. And I think an injury like this also gives you the perspective because, I don't know, like it, it, it happens quickly that, that soccer is everything. And of course, soccer is important to us and it's our life, yeah. but it's not everything in the end. Um, and I think an injury shows you that very, very clearly. So I think it's important to to also look for other things that you enjoy doing. Um for the time that you can't play soccer, but also for after when you can play again, just sure. to keep a balance. For sure. For sure. Um, and I think it also helps you to develop your game in a different kind because, I don't know, you you observe more the practices, the games. Maybe you can have a different look at also at the opponent. And, you know, you just... If you involve yourself in doing these things, you can you can learn a lot from the outside. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so to use that also and work on your weaknesses. I mean, um, I don't know if somebody gets pushed away easily by a tackle. Maybe you can work on your upper body while you're injured on your leg. Like of course, there are of course. always there are always uh, options to improve yourself. Mm-hmm. Self and mm-hmm. and I think it's important to just stay stay calm and to not Love pressure that. yourself. Like mm-hmm. I I also meditate and during my injury time I. I try to do it even more also, you know, visualization um, for my knee, like how it's healing and stuff like that. Like there's so many things that maybe awesome. you have a little bit more time for while you're injured. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's so. awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like you said, the big thing is perspective, you know, um, I, I love that. Like just, you know, trying to look at everything with a positive mindset. Yeah. Obviously being out, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's tough um, from every perspective. But um, like, like you said, flipping the switch, changing the lens, like asking yourself, what can you work on uh, that doesn't hurt the knee, that doesn't hurt the injured part? Um, and then, like you said, I mean, I think focusing as well on the mindset and, um, you know, trying to be patient and calm and take things day by day is also yeah. huge because I think if you come back to the pitch and, you, you know, you've worked on your upper body, you've, you've uh, you know, analyzed games you've worked on the mindset of, and you've sent good positive energy to the knee, like you'll be better than before, you know, and exactly. we, we always hear this saying, like, come back stronger, come back faster. <laughs> and, you know, I, it requires some, some, you know, some work, you know. For sure. And I think what I, what I think is also important, a lot of injured players, I feel like they take themselves out of the team but I think it's a good time to also, I don't know, you you observe your teammates and also just go up and be like, hey, you could have done this and this maybe better or I saw this and sure. this happening. So just sure. like stay involved and, um, you know, be there I for your that. teammates also. No, I love that. That's a, that's a great point. And I think part of the mental struggle could be like you're not used to that routine day to day being on the on the field with your teammates. But like you said, if you go and you observe – you know, the, the training and you, you see one of your teammates or your friends is, uh, you know, you try to help them out a little bit, they'll, you know, respect it and they'll feel that you're still in the team. Exactly, exactly. And also it gives you some sense of being part of the team still. Of course, of course. I love that. Um, so, you know, I always like to, we talk about a lot of on the pitch stuff. What type of, you know, we talk about it a little bit there. What type of things do you like to do off the pitch to kind of, because uh, I think we can both agree, you know, football is, is unbelievable, but sometimes we need to let the mind rest. Is there anything you do to take your mind off football and then the day-to-day uh, professional lifestyle? Yeah, like as I said, I, I try to meditate on a daily basis for sure. Um, I like to do yoga. <laughs> when i especially when i feel tired um sure. and then not physical activity i i like to read um yeah. i like to read i I play guitar and mm-hmm. sing <laughs> a little Love bit it. Love it. um 
and I just like being outdoors, like even just going for a walk or, um, you know, getting some fresh air because I don't know. I know a lot of soccer players, female and male, they just like sit inside their apartment all yeah. all their free time and I don't know, play for PlayStation sure. or whatever. Sure. But I, I mean, a day is fine, but I couldn't do that on a daily basis. For me, it's important to, to go out and do something. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. So what, what type of uh, meditation do you do? Do you do it by yourself, just focusing on your breath? Or do you have some type of app, some type of uh, guided meditation you listen to? Um, no, I, I started with Headspace um, okay, yeah, many years cool. ago. I, I still have it and I still use it. Um, but I, it's not that I'm dependent on it anymore. I think in the beginning, I, I needed the, the guided meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, but over the time, um, you, you learn to do it wherever you are, kind of, if, if For needed, sure. um, For sure. even if you're, I don't know, waiting in a line or whatever, just, you know, take some time to be present because we, mm -hmm. we usually are not. <laughs> yeah, 100%. No, I mean, I think that's, that's well said, like meditation doesn't have to be, you know, sitting in your living room with your, you know, your hands, you know, your legs crossed, yeah. and your hands on your knees. Like you can like daily tasks, you know, whether you're washing the dishes um, on a line, throwing out the garbage, that could be a form of moving meditation, you know, just focusing on where you're at at the moment. Yeah. And I think that plays a huge role. Um, Absolutely. What, like, just to point out to athletes and, and footballers, what, what have you noticed, you know, uh, change in your performance on the pitch uh, and in your life after being consistent with meditation? I think in general, I'm I'm way more balanced and, and calm and also very more spontaneous because I'm I grew up very German. Like, yeah. you know, I always have my to do list. Sure, I still have my to do sure. list. But yeah. when I was younger, I used to like freak out of something wasn't an order on my to-do list mm, or mm. I didn't have time to finish something. Um, and I don't know, with meditation, I got a little bit more relaxed with myself also. Like mm. if something doesn't work out the way I planned, it's not a big problem. I can adapt and just be in the moment, you know, because mm -hmm. usually if we mm -hmm. freak out, it's about something that's in the future that we For can't sure. really control or that has been in the past. And just being here right now, that's, that's the key. <laughs> Not always easy, but I think it, it gives you a sense of calmness and peace and also trust in whatever is happening. For sure. No, I love that. I mean, I used to be the same way myself. I mean, I, I love structure and, and I love the saying like, you know, uh, discipline and structure equals freedom, you know? So like when you have your structure and you do your discipline with that stuff, you can be free, but you know, sometimes, you know, uh, stuff happens, you know, uh, and you can't predict. And I think you got to you do the best that you could control what you can control. And then you, you leave the rest up to, you know, the universe to decide. And I think, Percy, for me to add on to that, like meditation for me consistently has made me not so reactive. So if something, you know, uh, were to, you know, go wrong on my schedule or I'm, I'm late here or something, you know, is off, I try to react in, in a calmer and a smoother way uh, instead of getting super frustrated, you know? Absolutely. And I think that also um, counts for on the, on the field because, yes, um, like, obviously I still catch myself sometimes still in moments where I, you know, let my head down after I lose a ball or something. But for sure it has been way, way worse when I was younger. And maybe the meditation is a big part of that too, to just... You know, what happened? Yeah. I run back, get the ball back. <laughs> like, for sure. Um, no, for sure. It's in, yeah, it's not been the past too much. Yeah, to add on to that, I, I actually, um, you know, I was I was training the other other day with a guy who uh, he's a one on one trainer, but used to be like a big, uh, you know, MLS player, big U.S. national team player, and we were training together. And uh, like, if he were to hit like a bad ball or a bad rep, like he wouldn't say anything to himself. And like Percy, for me, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. You know, I like to always, you know, get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept saying to myself, like, this guy, like, hits a bad ball and he doesn't say anything. Like, and I'll say, like, crap or whatever, be hard on myself. Yeah. So I, said, I said to him, I was like, you know, how do you develop that, man? Because it's something I've been working on. And he's like, 
honestly, like it's just helped me have that, you know, swagger on the pitch and people notice that, you know, if, if first of all, it's good for yourself and then also for your teammates and your coaches that like, if you don't react poorly to a bad pass or a bad shot or something, um, they automatically have more confidence in you. And mm -hmm. I, I think I thought, you know, it's, it's so interesting. And those little moments, that's why I think like the little things you do off the pitch, like meditation, yoga, if you can use those things to um, change the little moments and details that you have on the pitch, it could be a massive improvement. Absolutely. No, that's actually a good point because I think most of us are perfectionists and very hard sure. on themselves. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to have. Yeah, the the swagger I like that. The, that for word. sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So you know, we were talking before. Um, you know, you're an author of a book. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, if you that's could just right. Share, share a bit about that because I found that you know very interesting. Um, well, it kind of came um, while I was doing my masters um, at UConn. Still, um, I had to do this this project, and my professor wanted me to write kind of like a handbook for student athletes um Whoa. so i i did that as my like master's project and once i finished my master he was like you know it's it's really good if you if you keep working on this i think it can become a book wow. and and i was like what was your reaction cool. <laughs> yeah. i was kind of like oh shit yeah, that's so, bad. well if you say so i why not give yeah. it a try you know um so i I just, you know, kept working on it, um, you know, reading more studies, um, talking to other other student athletes, kind of, um, yeah, thinking about my own experiences in college. And so, yeah, I kept working on it and um, then I, I just went to publish it. <laughs> wow, so, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so what was the process like? I mean, you know, writing a book isn't easy. Uh, like, what was the process? Did you, um, I mean, I, I read about a lot of high performers and, and authors that write books. And sometimes like they have rituals, like, all right, before I touch my phone, before I do anything, I'm just going to go, I'm going to write a thousand words. And then, you know, later you edit it or something like that. Did you have some type of process or ritual or habit for that? Um, not really. Like, as I said, since it was kind of my master's project, the the main text, let's say, was already there. Of course, it wasn't mm -hmm, perfect. Mm -hmm. And for being a book, I, I had to work on it a lot. And I mean, I just tried to every day a little bit kind of thing. Like every day mm -hmm. I... And the thing is, especially as perfectionists, the the off the more often you read it, you you always find something that could For be sure. better. You sure. always find something, <laughs> which can be very tiring and annoying mm -hmm. because you feel like it's already perfect, and then you read it again, and yeah. it's not. <laughs> um, so it kind of takes some time to to feel satisfied with what you have written, um, and then honestly, for me, the writing itself wasn't even the the longest process for me, it was more the editing because mm. I'm personally not really good at formatting and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So that took the longest for me. And then the proofreading is just kind of redundant. Um, for sure. But I, I just try to like stay on top of it and just chip away like every day a little bit um, mm -hmm. to integrate it into my, my daily routine. So is it in German and, and English or, or just English? Just English. It's basically wow. like the, the audience, let's say, is, it's meant to be for student athletes. Um, uh -huh. Either people that are about to go to college, but also for people in college. And I also think it's, it can benefit anyone, not just student athletes, mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. it's tailored towards student athletes. Mm -hmm. So a little shameless plug, like where is it sold if people are interested and, and are interested in buying it? Where where can they find it? I mean, I'll also put a link below in the description, but uh, yeah, yeah where, where could people uh, find it? They it's it's available on Amazon. Nice. Um, in ebook and print version. Okay. And basically, in in every country, I also have it here. So. Wow! Awesome! Awesome! <laughs> Some <Okay>. advertisement. <laughs> yeah. Why not? You plan to audio book it as well? 
Not yet, but who knows? Yeah. Who knows someday, what's coming? Someday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. With that being said, like you know, I know I have a pretty big international audience, and I, I get a lot of messages about um, you know tips on getting into college and things like that. If you could give like the audience, you know, a couple of your best tips that maybe you wish you would have known before you went to college uh, as, as an international, as a German, what would they be, you know, to get them prepared and help them out? Well, I think nowadays what is very important is a, is a good highlight video. Um, Love that. Because, I mean, it's hard for, especially if you're international, for the coaches to come see you play or for you to go show yourself. So having good highlight um, material, video material, I think is key. Um, then also, I know for a- anyone who wants to go to college that also the educational, the school side is very important. So mm-hmm. your English should be on a decent level before going over and you should have decent grades because otherwise it'll be hard to get into good colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously soccer wise, I think just getting a lot of playing time um, so first of all for yourself but also for the video material the more you play the more scenes you can choose from to to show your best self um, yeah and I think the earlier you start the process the better um, because I did it very late because as I said it wasn't even on my radar for yeah. <laughs> what comes after school um, mm-hmm. and I'm sure if I would have started earlier to look into this I would have had First of all, more options, and second of all, also a better feeling of what college is perfect for me. For sure, for sure. I appreciate it. So overall, did you always have the dream? Did you always want to be a pro? Yeah, that's for sure. I okay. I love the idea um, of, you know, making life, like earning my money with what I love doing. Um, for sure, love that. Amen. I know it's 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 not as easy for a woman. And when I was young, there there was not not much women's soccer. Um, so I I always like when I was very young, my dream was to be the first woman in the men's national team. Well, <laughs> Obviously, yeah, total that. bullshit. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. you know, that's uh, it was always my dream to yeah. to to play soccer and for sure. to make that my life. For sure, love it. So you talked a little bit about. Um, you know, eating before training, things like that. Do you, uh, how do you look at your nutrition? Do you follow any type of specific diet? Uh, have you found any diet that works best for you? Um, how do you handle your nutrition overall? Yeah, for sure. That's been a very important process, uh, over my, the last years, I would say, especially, mm-hmm. um, because obviously when you're, when you're younger, I don't know, for me, at least it was like this, I could, eat whatever I want and I wouldn't gain weight or, you know, when you're young, but then once you hit puberty and, you know, I don't know, I, as a female, there was for sure a period where I struggled a little bit, not that I was overweight or anything, but your, your body just changes. And, um, it's, and I don't know, in the last, I would say two, three years, I think is when I actually found, what is best for my body um and i would say i eat basically gluten-free during the week Mm -hmm. um so very vegetable based um obviously also carbohydrates but without gluten Mm -hmm. um and obviously protein trying to to stay high on protein intake um and i also consume only a little bit of lactose like i usually try to stay lactose free as well nice. um and since since i've been doing that i a lot of people also say that i look like i lost a lot of weight even though i didn't even lose that much weight but i think i just kind of like Less i feel yeah like it, i i'm not as i don't know yeah, <laughs> um, a little yeah, bit leaner, I, I guess, is the, is the right word. Um, for sure. No, I mean, I think um, it's, you know, gluten and, and, you know, lactose is so common in today's society. And, you know, I'm not saying everyone is allergic or sensitive to to it. But, like, honestly, one of my best nutrition tips that I can give is, is try to, you know, really minimize or cut out gluten and lactose, especially if someone – 
has problems with bloating, has problems with digestion, even has problems with brain fog, sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, have you noticed any specific um, changes in, in overall lifestyle and performance since, you know, doing that? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I just feel better overall. And what I've also noticed is when I like a, a few years ago, sometimes during practice, you know, when you when your stomach just like moves with you, yeah, like yeah, when, yeah. You, when you run or jump. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Uh, I, I haven't had that since then. Like, I just mm -hmm. feel much lighter and fresher in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also a lot of times when let's say you eat pasta or whatever afterwards, you just you just yeah, are like in exactly. a in a hole and exactly. i don't i don't have that anymore um okay. i just feel like i have a good constant level of energy and um, i just feel better in general awesome but i'm sure you know your italian teammates and a lot of your friends back home are like you know you're in italy and you're not eating gluten like what's wrong with you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, that's why i'm saying like i i keep it pretty clean during the week and then For usually sure. after game day I, I have a pizza or whatever. Yeah, you have to. Um, you just have to. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Gotta gotta treat yourself every now and then. I think balance is key also here. So, one hundred percent. So yeah. before you also talked about yoga, um, <laughs> what type of recovery methods do you do you like to do? Uh, you know, yoga, other other any other type of of things to help your body recover. Um, from the strenuous, you know, day-to-day -day professional life? Yeah, um, other than yoga, I, I roll out or use the, the massage gun. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I, when I come back from practice, I literally just lay in my bed and put my legs up <laughs> for like 10 minutes. Sure. It's as simple as that. Um, yeah, of course, hydrate well. Um, stretching in general, like stretching, rolling. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the trick. I know not everyone feels like that, but for me, it for sure helps. Absolutely. And depending on the the tiredness, I feel also movement, like just sitting on the bike for 20 minutes, just an easy, mm -hmm. um, or going for a walk. And really, the or water also, like going into the pool. For sure. Um, stuff like that. Um, I'm pretty open to to anything and as i said it really depends on how i feel i don't mm -hmm. know it's hard to describe but yeah uh, yeah i mean before like we said i mean i think as a as a player as an individual you got to find what helps you most like some people might not like rolling some people might like rolling so i think you got to test yeah. things out i always say test things out experiment see what makes you feel best and helps you recover and, and do that you know exactly but yeah, as we get to the to the end part of the interview, just a couple more questions. Um, if you could go back to yourself at any age and give yourself the the knowledge that you have now at 26 years old, what age would you go back to and what would you tell yourself? Yeah, that is a very difficult one. question. Yeah. yeah. No, you can take a couple but... of moments. I always stump people on this one. Yeah, no, I, I actually – kind of know I think and I I'm just thinking I'm not sure how old I was exactly but I would say 15 16 maybe mm -hmm. and I was I was in a phase where I was I just made the youth national team um, I was you know living a, a good life in terms of success for my age um, and I kind of became very much um, too much like I, I wanted too much i wanted uh i was training already what i was training which was already a lot and then i wanted to do more i wanted sure. uh to, to keep improving to do more wow. to i was too strict you know and i think mm -hmm. going going back now i would say slow down like relax 100%. you 100%, yeah. you don't have to train i don't know 10 hours a day um and in the end uh I'm, sh I'm sure that's also why I had, I don't know, more muscular problems or, you know, just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. certain things showing up or getting getting sick. I don't know. But 100%. it was just too much. And going back, I would tell myself to, to slow down and to take it easy and also enjoy life and not just not just soccer. 
Love that. Love that. I, I can completely relate. And I second that. Like when I was uh, 19 or 20, when I first went over to Europe, you know, I was training like seven, eight hours a day for like 10 months straight. Wasn't going out and hanging out with friends as much. I was just really tunnel visioned and like just always training, always training, always thinking about training. And uh, like after 10 months, I was just like burnt out, you know, and obviously I got much better technically and I improved myself. But I think like there's there's things that like indirectly improve when you like just can relax. Like, yeah, you, you do your quality training and then you can switch off. Um, there's a guy that I listen to. He's, he's a neurologist. His name's Andrew Huberman. If I mean, you're, you're probably very into the brain since you studied psychology. I highly yeah. recommend him. He talks about how high performers have the ability to switch on and switch off very quickly. And, and that's yeah. what I can try to relate to now when I see other high performers. It's like, wow, like this guy or girl like can be super intense and then boom, switch off, relax and rest. And, you know, from a physiological standpoint, that's you grow at rest. You know, you don't grow when you're training. So, um, yeah, I completely agree with you. And I would say the same to myself. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as we said in the beginning, I think it's it's that perspective and that that balance that that really helps you as a player, but also as a person. And of course, it's um, it's important to keep that. Of course, yeah. So, just last last uh, question for the podcast: If you could give younger players um, or players trying to maintain their pro status two to three tips. Uh, to sign their first professional contract or a new professional contract, what would they be? Um, well, I think uh, believing in yourself, it sounds very cliche, also, but yeah. um, it is true because we all hit roadblocks or especially I know it's it's tough sometimes when it comes to the end of a season and you don't know yet, does the team want to keep me? Will I have a new contract? I don't really have the offers that I want. Like these are times where you get very nervous as a soccer player and it can be very tough times. And I think it's important to, to stay calm and to know what you're capable of doing, um, regardless of the outside, regardless of the offers that you get or don't get. Um, sure. I think that's a, that's a big one. Sounds super cliche, but just to keep believing in yourself and knowing what you're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And kind of going along with that, I guess, just trusting the process, like okay. knowing that whatever comes, even though you might not see it in that moment, why it's the right thing for you, that if you trust it, it'll be the right thing for you. And even if it seems like a step back or like you're not moving forward, it it can be what exactly is needed for your development. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. 100%. No, I, I love both of those. And like you said, like, you know, sayings are cliche, but they're cliche because they work for a reason. And, you know, you could post quotes on Instagram and, and read story things. And, but once you actually embody it and you do and you do actually believe in yourself um, and you do trust the process and you put that into action in your daily life, you're like, damn, that stuff really, really does work. Yeah. And. One of my favorite quotes is actually um, to to not be scared of the gap of who you are and who you want to be, but to be inspired by it. I because there's obviously, I mean, we all have dreams and they can be, they can seem very far away, but that should never be something that scares you or um, yeah, holds you back, but just something that inspires you to, to wake up every day and, and give it your best and try to improve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. i love it and last last thing you said you like reading uh if you could give like one or two book recommendations for athletes to improve their mind improve on the field off the field what would they be uh my absolute favorite is the peaceful warrior from dan Mill dan millman really i never um, read, read that i have to read that yeah no that's my absolute favorite okay. i love that okay. book um, it's about uh, a gymna gymnast and in, in, at UC Berkeley. It's also mm -hmm. based on a true story. Dan Millman himself. Wow. Um, I I love it. It's 
That's amazing. That's my go-to. I read it at least once a year. <laughs> wow, wow, I love it. Oh, uh, there's so many good books out there nowadays. Um, but that's All right, so let's leave it with one. one. Let's leave it with one. Yeah. Let's not overwhelm them. Make sure you read The Peaceful Warrior and also exactly. grab Bibby's book. And uh, you'll be all right. Uh, so, yeah, if you could, you know, if people want to ask you questions, reach out. Um, you can just, you know, provide maybe your Instagram, email, wherever is best to uh, reach out to you and ask you some advice. What would that be? Uh, yeah, I think Instagram is is perfect for now. I don't have perfect. that many followers, so I think I, I will see if somebody um, reaches out uh, and has a question. Sounds great. And we'll post that below in the show notes. And thanks for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much for having me. It was an honor. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Ciao.